Over the last several years, the disability movement has both reflected and inspired change. Throughout our history, there were few opportunities for people with disabilities in terms of social inclusion, accessibility, and human rights. Now, the bar is continuously being raised. Canadians with disabilities and the disability movement have transitioned from being hidden to becoming leaders and champions of change. You are about to meet four people who are an integral part of changing the world for people with disabilities, their families, and ultimately our communities. But in 1992, I sustained a, an acquired brain injury from a car crash. I was tired all the time after this injury. I had surgery for it. It was a subdural hematoma. Fatigue, depression. I was sad because I lost myself. I have really, really good family support. My wife is a nurse, so she knew some of the things to look for. I've been fortunate to deal with a whole range of disabilities and, and have friends in every area, and my life has been enriched because of those friends, because of those connections. Again and again, people say, well, you look good, you look fine. And I'm thinking, I am not fine. My wife says that I'm not the same man she married. And I always think I'm glad she loves us both. We have a support group here in Regina that is absolutely precious. And, and I think over the years, things have improved. I think people are understanding more about invisible disabilities. Understanding the past influence is important. It influences public policies that have a direct impact on people with disabilities as policymakers learn from the past while being influenced to improve practices in the present. Canada's first immigration laws sought to prevent the immigration of people with disabilities when it was assumed there would be a need for support from the community. Presently, community groups have been advocating for a more open Canadian immigration policy for persons with disabilities. This work is ongoing, and in order to foster an inclusive society, Canada needs to show that they value all people. We have a couple of youth programs, so we have a girl power camp and a yes camp. So the girls one is for girls and the boys one is for boys. Well, yes, it's for boys and it's for youth 14 to 29 with any disability. And we teach them skills like self-esteem and self-advocacy, safety from abuse, um, how to date with a disability, how to tell a boy you like him, how to make friends, how to tell a girl you like them, all those kinds of life skills that sometimes the kiddos don't get in their daily lives. And we have lessons on hygiene, budgeting, um, goal setting, how to make a decision, how to interact with people, how to ask for help, all sorts of different things. But they're kind of geared more to like grade 9, 10 lesson plans, not pre-high, you know, post-first year university lessons, because we want everyone to understand them and be able to get something out of them. <laughs> Some of our kiddos have FASD or ADHD or they have, they're on the autism spectrum somewhere. Some are wheelchair users, some are partially sighted, some ha are deaf or hard of hearing. It's anybody with any kind of disability. In 1975, the General Assembly of the United Nations proclaimed the Declaration on the Rights of Disabled Persons. This document illustrates that all persons with disabilities have the same fundamental rights as fellow citizens and shall be protected from any acts discriminatory, degrading, or abusive in nature. The Declaration marked the beginning of a more inventive approach to disability issues as human rights issues. Its adoption led to several succeeding UN initiatives that built upon one another. The establishment of the International Year of Disabled Persons, 1981, serving as a major milestone. Adoption of this new global declaration ultimately led individual countries to be more conscious about the rights for people with disabilities. 
In 1977, the Canadian Human Rights Act declared that all individuals should experience opportunities to make a life that they desire to live. Yeah, well, when I first started taking my training back in the late 60s, people were still um, institutionalized in the mental health area in Battlefords and in Weyburn. And deinstitutionalization had started about 10 years earlier and people were discharged into the community and that was seen as a very good thing. The thing that was not so good though is uh, that the services that were needed to support those people in the community simply were not in place. And to some degree, and a large degree actually, we're still chasing around some of those services, you know, five decades later. There's no question though that for most people, many people if not most, uh, living in the community, while it's, it's uh, uh, different than the institution, it is better than the institution. People have their freedom, uh, people are able to live a much more community-based life. However, uh, many of the needs, such as an adequate income, um, a decent place to live, enough income to have a decent diet, those kind of things are really not in place yet for people. So. Our contention is, is that there's a systemic discrimination against the mental health and addictions system compared to the physical health system. If there's a study done, for instance, a shortage on surgery beds or whatever, within months they have put 25 or 50 million dollars or whatever into that to try and solve it, and it should be. However, with the Mental Health and Addictions Action Plan, which took a year and a half to put together, it's very good. Uh, it's interministerial in nature, so it's not just health, it's social services, education, justice, and health. Take a guess how much that they committed to that when they announced it. Zero dollars. Guess how much they put in now? Less than a million dollars. You know there's over 50 billion dollars a year lost in Canada, you know, in our, in our economy due to people being off or not functioning fully uh, because of mental illness. But like any other illness, the earlier that you can deal with it, the better the outcomes are. And all of our systems, because of the shortage of resources, are really set up that you have to get almost so ill first before you even qualify for some services. So the problem is when you wait that long and you've kind of reached the end of your rope and then you phone for help and they say, oh, well, yeah, you know, you could get to see somebody in about three months. That's just that's just like a kick in the head for people, right? And their families. And so we need to find the resources to put it in so when somebody finally comes to that stage, it's like, yeah, come on in. You can see somebody tomorrow. What we're ending up with is more people looking for services, which is putting a strain on waiting lists and adequacy of those programs just from that. So we've got to get past the talking stage and start getting into some action about resourcing adequate programs. In 2010, Canadian citizens recognized the Government of Canada's leadership during the drafting and the steadfast commitment to a CRPD that is built upon Canadian values of equality, non-discrimination and the duty to accommodate. Canada continues to address the social and economic barriers of persons with disabilities. We still have work to do to be an equitable, inclusive, global leader in education, employment, health care, social policy and legislation. Creating opportunities for open dialogue and collaboration has provided a place for corporations, governments, service organizations, and consumer rights groups have all found common ground. Our organization was founded in partnership with the Ministry of Social Services uh, back in, gosh, July of 2009. And, and the reason why the organization came to be was that there was a recognition in 2008 by, by government that there were a number of people um, unable to access supports living in our community based on the sheer complexity of, of who they are as a person. 
being that they, they're challenging behaviors, uh, they have perhaps multiple diagnoses, they had involvement with the judicial correction system, uh, maybe have some mental health struggles, coupled with a developmental disability, folks who have fallen into the gaps of the service delivery system. And, and because they, they touched on multiple systems of support, um, and, and or presented uh, challenges to the service delivery um, system. They were uh, ending up in places like hotels, uh, the, the mental health inpatient unit at the RQHR, um, living in provincial institutions, uh, places that are not home. The ministry in 2008 made a commitment to providing supports to these folks who were unable to access services. How it's unique is that it's putting relationships at the core or at the center of caregiving, right? And, and through those relationships, you're able to have a meaningful impact on someone's well-being because you establish trust. We're carving out support that's unique to each individual person and, and what are their, their hopes, goals, needs, and, and dreams. Together, we can address systemic barriers in partnership with a broad network of local and national organizations. We have accomplished this through advocacy, community education, and media to reform systems and practices to achieve dramatic improvements for people with disabilities. We've all come a long way over the last 150 years. People with disabilities and their families are becoming socially and economically empowered. There is much to celebrate, but we can't stop now. There is a long and exciting journey ahead to create the kind of world that we want for ourselves and for generations to come.